Good evening, everybody. Welcome to our Japan Society's webinar, Japanese Pop Culture, Connecting the World Through Manga and Anime. We welcome you tonight. My name is Ramona Handelbaima. I'm the Chief Program Officer at Japan Society. And we are so happy that you're here to, to talk to us um, about, this, about this very important topic. Um, first, please allow me to thank the people who have made this possible our co-presenter for the Living Tradition series, Portland Japanese Garden, and we have received additional support for the webinar series provided by the government of Japan, and the Talks Plus program season sponsors, Mitsubishi, UFJ Financial Group, and Oryx Corporation USA. An anonymous, anonymous donor, the Sandy Heck Lecture Fund, Anne Helen and Kenneth A. Cowan. Thank you for making this happen. So, Tonight's the, and this morning for some of you, is the fifth and final um, part of our Living Traditions um, webinar series. We started with gardens and moved through Zen, and now here we are with anime, with a deeper dive into these really interesting cultural phenomenons coming out of Japan. This series has unraveled the historical journeys of some of the most iconic facets of Japanese culture through conversations between thought provoking experts like the ones we have tonight and cultural stewards like the ones we have tonight and how they maintain deep rooted traditions in the present day. This talk explores some of the latest trends and emerging technologies in Japanese pop culture, including the historical development of manga and anime, the global influence of otaku culture and what the future may bring inside and outside of Japan. So um, I'd like to just introduce our speakers this evening. Um, First, I'm really excited to introduce Julia Meckler. Um, she works for Mixie Inc., a Japanese mobile gaming company as a business development manager. Um, tonight, she's talking to us as a creator of manga. Um, she's the creator of the Okinawan themed comic book, Hymn of the Teada, and is also an expert on Okinawan traditional performing arts, producing shows in Okinawa that mesh traditional dance and digital entertainment. And allow me just one moment to say, Japan Society is um, dedicating 2022 programming um, to Okinawa related events um, and, and offerings because of to mark the 50 year anniversary of the reversion of, of Okinawa to Japanese control after the US occupation. So it's really exciting to have Julia tonight to be able to talk about all of these elements of her creative process and her work. So thanks, Julia. We also have Roland Kelt who is a Tokyo-based Japanese-American writer, journalist, scholar, and authority on Japanese and Western cultures. He's the author of the best-selling book, Japan America, a columnist for the Japan Times. Um, I read you, Nolan, hello. A contributing editor of Monkey, New Writing from Japan, and a professor at Waseda University in Tokyo. Um, finally, I will introduce our moderator. Bill Tsui is an award-winning scholar and teacher specializing in the economic, environmental, and cultural history of modern Japan. Educated at Harvard, Oxford, and Princeton universities, he has published widely on Japanese popular culture and globalization. He currently serves as president and professor of history at Ottawa University. So that's it for me, just gratitude and um, tremendous interest in the conversation tonight. Welcome everybody, thank you. Okay, hello. I guess I'm going to start things off uh, here tonight. And um, uh, thank you, Ramona, for that great introduction. Um, it's an honor for me to be here with Julia and Bill and to be joining the Japan Society once again. Uh, we've done a few events in the past in New York, and it's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be, uh, to be back here. Um, I'm going to deliver a short introduction uh, with the concept of living traditions in mind, since that's the name of the series that we're a part of here, we're closing it out. And, uh, you know, for, in the years since I wrote and published my book, Japan America, uh, a lot of people have asked me, so Roland, when, is, when are anime and manga gonna go mainstream? 
When do they go mainstream? And of course, leaving aside the fact that the definition of mainstream has changed a lot in intervening years, what is mainstream, uh, with all this content and all these content platforms, I think it's arguable that the mainstream came to anime and manga. <laughs> in other words, rather than manga and anime going mainstream, mainstream came to manga and anime. And partly that's because of the explosive fan base outside of Japan. Um, for the first year, uh, last year, um, the foreign or overseas market eclipsed the domestic market in anime. So the, 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 the revenue from the, from the overseas market eclipsed the domestic market, and that's probably going to continue uh, into the, uh, certainly into the near future. Um, there is explosive growth in manga, especially. We know that anime is showing up on all kinds of streaming platforms. Netflix had, has made huge investments, Hulu, HBO Max, um, you name it. Disney, even Disney Plus is getting into anime. Um, and what the result has been is that manga has just gone through the roof. And anime, even in for decades, anime in Japan, animated shows have served as something of an advertisement for manga originals. In other words, the anime series comes out, people see it on TV, it's easy to digest, and then they want to read the manga or the comic form, the print form. And that's been happening in Japan for years, and now it's happening all over the world. And believe it or not, and this is, this is an NPD book scan figure, but manga sales between 2020 and 2021 spiked 171%. I know that sounds like an inflation figure, but it's actually true, according to NPD Book Scan, in the United States, manga sales grew by 171% over the year 2020 to 2021. So it's just um, dynamite in terms of the explosive interest in manga, um, and of course, anime, uh, particularly on streaming platforms. So I'm going to very, very quickly, since it's living traditions, go through something that might be boilerplate for some of you, and I apologize, but just address some of the key traditions from Japanese culture that feed into what we know of as modern manga and anime. And it's important to use the term hybrid uh, or hybridity. Um, modern manga and anime are hybrid art forms in the same way that modern Hollywood is a hybrid. Uh, it's not purely American by any means, and anime and manga are not purely Japanese by any means. Uh, as many of you know, Western influence, uh, particularly in the Meiji era in the 19th century, and then after World War II in the 20th century, came into Japan and flooded Japan, arguably. And so what we know of as modern manga and anime is a hybrid art form. Um, particularly combining Japanese and Western influences. So very quickly, I've got a few slides and Aki-san, can you just uh, put them up here? Okay, great. That's the, uh, the intro slide and it's hard for me to see this. So uh, the first slide here is, and again, many of you, this will be boilerplate, but imakimono or scroll paintings going back to seventh and eighth century Japan. Um, it can be traced back to 7th and 8th century Japan. It kind of had a flowering in the 12th and 13th centuries. Um, but what I wanted to point out here is that scroll paintings, the content is often irreverent, very funny, uh, often pokes fun at the upper classes. So you have this tradition of illustrated uh, narrative art that again, going back to the 8th century, uh, the 12th and 13th century when it flourished, already contains elements that we think of as um, fundamental to manga and anime. Funny, irreverent, bawdy, um, sometimes poking fun at the aristocratic classes. Um, it contains a lot of fun and energy and curiosity. And aesthetically speaking, um, Imakimono uh, were sort of defined by an economy of line, very, very smart strokes and simple lines 
again, if you want to take it all the way up to the 20th century, you think of Hello Kitty, which is, uh, depending on your source, 16 or 17 lines and no mouth. So economy of line is already there going back to Imakimono scroll paintings, or if you think of Pikachu, right? It's just an outline. It's, it's very, very vivid outline, but incredibly simple and economical. Okay, so next slide. We'll go through this quickly. <laughs> uh, there, it's also, it's a form of storytelling. So as you know, you unfurl the scrolls, you unroll the scrolls uh, and read the scrolls across uh, the, pa the, the uh, paper. And what's interesting here is, you know, uh, and I wanna uh, mention my, my good friend, Fred Schott, Frederick L. Schott, whose book Manga Manga is the resource. If you're curious as to how these traditional forms became manga or influenced manga, that's your resource, Manga Manga by Fred Schott. But here you see you unscroll, and, and some of them, as, as Fred points out, could be 80 feet long. Massive stories told pictorially. Sorry, we'll go to the next slide. And of course, uh, more recently, 19th century in particular, ukiyo-e or woodblock printing, which would take this economy of line and emphasis on line and storytelling and produce it in a mass produced uh, formula. So ukiyo-e could be mass produced, they were sold as low art, again, like manga. People used to read uh, manga uh, in the trains in Tokyo and just leave the books behind on the, uh, on the uh, shelves because they, they were disposable. And ukiyo-e were similarly low art to be mass produced, but containing some of those similar aesthetic elements, could be body, could be erotic, could be funny, could be irreverent. Um, so you have here something of a formula for what we think of as modern manga and anime. Okay. And then kamishibai. Some of you know uh, paper plays or paper storytelling really flourished in Japan in the 1930s. And then uh, in the post-war period when a lot of Japanese were impoverished and these uh, street corner storytellers would go out and sliding images into their little paper uh, theater boxes would tell stories mostly to children on street corners. But it was again, a pictorial narrative. And some would say it was the precursor to television uh, in Japan before Jap most Japanese had TVs. Um, there were these uh, paper storytellers, but certainly a relationship to the storytelling of manga. Okay, next. Sorry, I'll do this very quickly. <laughs> uh, the other thing I wanted to mention here is the um, something that my good friend, the author Danica Davison, was talking about with me. She writes about manga, and she, she's incredibly well-read in manga, a terrific writer, and she mentioned the, the, the difference in storytelling and the emotional tones that you find in Japanese stories that you might not find or tend not to find in Western stories. Certainly, um, there's a tradition in Japanese storytelling of a kind of more porous blending of emotional tones. And I've put up this very famous uh, Hokusai image, uh, woodblock print uh, of uh, Kohara Koheji. I'm not gonna have time to go into the whole story, but he was a kabuki actor who the lore has it, he played ghosts in Kabuki theater, and then he was killed by his wife and her lover. And this image is of him looking down on them in their, their bed uh, as a ghost, <laughs> looking down through a mosquito net at the two of them uh, doing whatever they're doing in their bed. And he, it's his ghost come back to haunt them. And what I wanna point out in this is the mix of emotions. He's got this googly kind of comical eyes and this uh, wacky grin. It's a, it's a brilliant mix of terror and comedy. And, you know, I was reading uh, Akutagawa recently and some of you know the famous story Rashomon which was made into a film by Kurosawa. But the original short stories uh, by Akutagawa there's actually a story called Rashomon and then there's a story called In a Bamboo Grove. And it's incredible because it's these three people talking about their involvement in a sexual assault and a murder. And it winds up being quasi comical because they all confess to the crime. So they're all confessing in a second version voice like, I, yes, I did it. I did it. I did it. Which is absurd because one of them had to do it and the others couldn't have done it. 
So even the dead man speaks to the judge. Um, so this, this idea of storytelling that spans different emotional tones and territories and, you know, um, maybe things that we don't expect when we're coming from Western culture. Okay, next slide. So here, just to bring it really fast forward up to anime, you know, many of you will recognize this is from one of the great television anime series, Cowboy Bebop by uh, Watanabe Shinichiro. And this is, <laughs> I, I went back and looked at this episode recently. It's episode 11 of the series. It's on Netflix if you want to see it. The whole story is about this um, weird, wacky virus that is released on their ship, their junky old ship. And it seems like it might be killing them. It's quite terrifying, actually. It's, it's leaving these purple marks and knocking the crew out. And the whole story is about this. And then you discover at the end that it's, um, it's bacteria that emerged from a crustacean that's been left too long in the fridge. So the, the closing scene is the fridge sort of being tossed out of the ship and floating in outer space. It's a refrigerator. So this is what I want to give you, this example. It's comic, it's banal, it's terrifying. And of course, in our COVID age, it's incredibly relevant. Um, but it's very, very funny too. And you sort of are left, you know, you're, if you're a Western viewer in particular, you're off balance. Like, what are they doing? Well, how can they do this in one episode? Um, and I think a lot of good American TV recently has learned from that. Um, because certainly a lot of the stuff you see on, on uh, streaming services now, American shows, I think take a lot from anime. Okay, next slide. Sorry, I know we're running out of time. Um, and then here we have, you know, some of you will recognize uh, Light Yagami from the, the main character of, of, uh, of Death Note. And he's, again, a very complicated figure. And on the one hand, he has, he's corrupted by power, which is a typical anime meme. Uh, Akira is a great example of a classic corruption by power. He can kill people. On the other hand, um, he has a great sense of justice. He's trying to get rid of criminals and bad elements. And then we discover later in the series that he actually has compassion when he loses his memory and tries to get rid of the notebook. But then he's almost like an addict. He can't get rid of the power. The notebook gives him the power to kill. Um, so some of you who watch or read modern manga and anime will know what I'm talking about uh, with that show. Okay, next slide. Okay, and then very quickly here, just to sum up, um, there is, uh, and I, uh, I'm crediting Scott McCloud, uh, his wonderful book, Understanding Comics, where he describes different senses of storytelling in comics and uh, uses this term aspect to aspect versus action to action. And I just want to draw your attention to a style of storytelling, because I'd like to talk a bit about storytelling today, that is not so driven by action, which is very typical of American Marvel comics or DC comics, but is driven by aspect to aspect. So a sort of contemplative slowing down of time. And again, this is consistent to me with Japanese literature as well, which we can talk about, but there's a slowing down of time where you're not moving from you know, narrative beat to beat to beat, but you're actually moving from quiet space to quiet space. And of course, this is consistent with uh, Japanese poetry as well. So I hope we'll be able to address this. And I'm sorry that took so long. <laughs> that was supposed to be a very quick economical course. Uh, but thank you very much for listening. Okay. Hello, everyone. My name is Julia Meckler. And um, thank you for having me today. It's such an honor. Um, okay, you can put on the slide. All right, so let's um, let's skip to the second and third one. There you go. Um, I would like to introduce myself first. Um, I was born in Minnesota and grew up in Okinawa uh, until I was 18. I went back to Minnesota for college. Now, now I go back and forth between New York and Okinawa for my job. Currently, I'm a producer and dancer for an Okinawan traditional dance concerts, creator for Hymn of the Tita, which I will talk about later in the slide, and a group manager for Mixi US operations. Next slide, please. 
Um, let me talk about Okinawa for a little bit in case you're not familiar. Okinawa is the southernmost island of Japan, and it used to be a kingdom called the Ryukyu Kingdom before it was annexed to Japan in the 19th century. During World War II, it was the only place in Japan that experienced land battle, and after the war, it was a U.S. territory until 1972. Currently, about 15% of the island is U.S. military base. Next slide, please. Um, because of the post-war American influence, entertainment culture developed differently from mainland Japan. Anime, manga, and otaku culture never became major. For example, my mother grew up watching Flintstones, Popeye, and Bewitched on TV. I also grew up watching a TV channel called the AFN, which is the Armed Forces Network. Okinawa only have about five channels, and until 2011, AFN was one of the major TV channels people watched. Next slide, please. In addition to the American influence, due to the lack of TV channels um, in Okinawa, there are very few anime aired in Okinawa. There are anime shows for children on NHK, so people perceive anime as something for children, not for grown-ups. Because of that, anime or manga related events never was popular until um, the US military base started hosting Comic-Con Okinawa in 2016. It is interesting how people in Okinawa started accepting anime and manga more as an entertainment for grownups when they saw the Americans doing it. And now Comic-Con Okinawa is one of the major events on the island and many famous anime voice actors and manga artists attend. In addition to that, um, the spread of streaming sites is starting to push. I'm sorry, I'm in quarantine right now, so I got to take this call really quick. Just a minute, please. Okay, I'm sorry about that. Just a quick story. Um, I just got back to Japan three days ago <laughs> and I'm in quarantine. So they call me every day to check my temperature and if I'm like, if I don't have COVID. Or <laughs> I'm so sorry about that. <laughs> okay, back to the topic. Um, so I think I was talking about the Comic-Con um, base um, and then streaming sites. Anime streaming sites is starting to push the popularity of anime and manga on the island. Next slide, please. And now let me talk a little bit about my manga called Hymn of the Tida. It is a time traveling fantasy about a teenager Okinawan girl. One of the reasons I wanted to create this series is because there are very few or close to none manga or anime with Okinawan protagonists and about Okinawa. My original goal was to publish this in Japan, but an American publisher was more interested in the theme. Oftentimes in Japan, I was told it's too local and will not be interesting by many publishers. But when I met Matt, the CEO of Heavy Metal Magazine, he saw potential. Heavy Metal Magazine is a publisher that inspired Stephen King, Steven Spielberg, and more. So I was pretty excited when I got the deal. My goal is to continue creating the series and one day into an anime. And next slide, please. And if you're familiar uh, or a fan of Anison, um, anime song, you might know Bless 4, who sang Sosei no Aquarian, Miro, and more. While I was struggling to find a publisher in Japan, they reached out to me and offered to create theme songs for Hymn of the Tida. Um, their parents are from Okinawa, and they grew up in the United States uh, before they came back to Japan. When they came back, that's when they released um, Sosei no Aquarian and became popular in the Anison world. The theme song is called uh, for Hymn of the Tida is Tedashiro no Kamiuta and Heiwa no Inori. Um, we've done a couple Anasan and Okinawan traditional dance merging concerts together several times in Tokyo and Okinawa. Um, now with anime and manga becoming more global and diverse, we're hoping that Hymn of the Tida could be considered not too local and be embraced as part of the diversity. Um, next slide, please. And in addition to him of the Tida, I am also working with the CEO of Heavy Metal Magazine to create manga about Okinawa's traditional musical stories and folk stories. I enjoy seeing the traditional performing arts world merge with the otaku culture and would like to see and create more cross-media collaborations. Okay, last slide, which ties into my last slide. Now it is becoming more and more common to see multimedia development when it comes to manga or anime IP. At Mixi, we do many collaborations with anime IPs with our games, 
And last year we launched an interactive story gaming app, which is like reading a manga, but choosing your own adventure style. As the platform to enjoy anime and manga becomes more and more diverse and the production process becoming globalized, I would like to see today in our discussion how this is going to affect the otaku culture and if anime and manga will remain made in Japan. Okay, that's it for my slide. Thank you for listening. Well, uh, what a pleasure it is to be here with Julia and Roland and have the opportunity to talk with them uh, about a topic of almost endless fascination to me, the ongoing global embrace of Japanese popular culture and especially anime and manga. I just want to thank Japan Society, the Portland Japanese Garden and the government of Japan for bringing us all together today. So let's get right into it since I have a lot to discuss with you, Julia and Roland. So when I was growing up hundreds of years ago, uh, there was a standard way in which most kids in America drew human figures, which is like a smiley face with a stick figure underneath it, uh, right? But a while ago, and uh, I think I'd say probably from the 1990s going into the new millennium, that really changed. So that today, if you ask a 12 year old to draw a person, they will do it in the graphic style of manga and anime with big heads, huge eyes and dramatic hair. And I think that's true in Las Vegas or London or Lagos or La Paz, the visual style of Japanese pop has become something truly global. So in this situation, what makes Japanese anime and manga so special? What sets it apart from all the animation and graphic novels and comics currently being produced around the world? Roland, do you wanna start us off? Sure. Um, that's a great question, Bill. Uh, thanks. Um, well, first of all, I, I think the, as I, as I wrote in Japan America, the Rosetta Stone, if you will, for uh, anime uh, was Pokemon. I mean, it's really, there's kind of, um, <laughs> there's kind of a before Pokemon and after Pokemon. <laughs> Uh, and that was the late 1990s. There was there were anime fans, of course, before Pokemon and people who uh, respected, uh, you know, classics like Tezuka Osamu and, and, and the great anime artists and manga artists of an earlier generation. But Pokemon really blew the doors off of fandom around the world. And those images, as I said earlier in my presentation, that economy of line. Um, really, I think on the one hand is attractive because if they're the right lines, <laughs> you can recognize the character right away. It's, it's, it's almost like, to be honest, it's almost like great advertising. It's like the Coca-Cola, you know, if you, if you, if you get the lines right, you recognize the character right away. And it's this instant identification, which is very, very powerful. And again, it's not exclusively Japanese. I mean, let's face it. Uh, one of America's greatest uh, cartoonists, Charles Schultz, created uh, very simple characters, Charlie Brown and Snoopy, with a great economy of line. So it's not exclusively a Japanese uh, aesthetic, but it is powerfully brought to life in anime and manga. And I think Pokemon really changed a generation of fans and artists outside of Japan. I think that was a signal uh, title. Um, I think too, there is something participatory about manga and anime. I mean, they feel like media that you can join. I think this is the power of otaku culture. They feel open to you in ways that maybe Marvel comics or DC comics have not. They felt sort of detached, you know, sort of like, I always feel like with Marvel and DC, you're watching the events happen on a stage. Like it's very powerful, it's very epic. It's like the Super Bowl, you know, very American. It's happening on this big, big stadium and stage. Whereas manga and anime feel like they're in your back pocket. Like, oh, I know these guys. And, you know, again, to, to quote my friend Danica Davison, she was saying, you know, a lot of manga and anime start very quietly. The stories don't start with a big bang. 
And the, the sort of conventional storytelling arc in, in certainly for kids books in America and the West is to start with something big to get everybody's attention. But most manga and anime, they're, they're like everyday life stories. They start really quietly. And I think that feels, particularly for a younger generation, that feels participatory. Like you can join, you're in it, you're part of it. It's not pushing you away. Like you're not, you're not, you're not on stage in the Super Bowl. It's famous people. But in, in manga and anime, it feels like you're, you're part of it, I think. Sorry, I went on for a while. <laughs> I just love that, Roland. It's almost like uh, there is a kind of intimacy about anime that draws you into it. And I know I feel that uh, when I'm watching uh, a series as opposed to an American blockbuster uh, movie. Yeah, exactly, exactly. Julia, do you have any thoughts on this? Um, about the intimacy, I think it's because Japan is a country um, doesn't have like one religion that you know everyone believes in. So that kind of um, creates a story that's more open to any group of people. And also the characters and Japanese anime or manga, you can't really tell where they're from. They're supposedly in Japan, but like, like for example, Sailor Moon, they're all blonde, brown hair, blue hair, all kinds of crazy hair colors. Um, I, I don't think you see that a lot in um, especially traditional American comic books or movies. Um, so I think that could be part of why it's it, people all over the world feel like they could be part of it um, and then can immerse themselves in the story because there's no barrier. Um, like, for example, I think I, I'm just gonna bring an example for Marvel movies. Um, you, the character is very specific, um, specifically described, he's like, a, um, journalist or someone from outer space, but there is a little bit of ambiguity to the character description in Japanese manga and anime. And I think that's actually pretty realistic because um, all of us are not one facet. We, we just have many multiple faces to many people. And I think um, how they describe the Japanese characters um, in manga and anime, they're good at that. We could talk about this subject forever, I think, because it is really fascinating and there's so many different angles to it. Uh, but I want to be sure and touch a little bit uh, on the manga and anime industry, uh, which, like everything these days, uh, has become increasingly globalized with Japanese talent working in other countries, including the United States, with production widely distributed uh, across nations and continents, with streaming services being a huge global presence and with audiences being truly worldwide and scale. Uh, and Julia, since you're an example of this globalization in action, can you talk a little bit more about the industry today? Sure, um, I, I was um, tasked to do that exactly for Mixie's um, work. I, I started a um, team production team in the United States. I was dispatched to um, in the, to the States from Tokyo last year. And then I was in charge of creating a group of people to create this um, interactive story game, which is um, in a way it's a form of manga. Uh, so we have um, American, Amer working, American members working, Japanese member working, and also we have some people in Colombia and it's, it's very diverse and global. But we are making a Japanese content. So that's what's interesting. But it is a Japanese content. You know, that's, <laughs> that's the question I had in my slide too. Roland, do you have thoughts or perspectives on this? I know it's something you have worked on a great deal. Yeah, I mean, there, there's, I mean, I don't want to get too far in the weeds here, but I know, I'm sure Julia knows about this. There's, there's some trouble brewing in Japan. I mean, the, the fact is that the anime industry in particular just still doesn't pay very well and is the way it's currently been run is unsustainable to be honest. Um, and no surprise, but, um, uh, 
some Chinese uh, animation companies and China's pushing animation very hard, uh, you know, funding it very, very, very intensely. They're, they're uh, I don't want to say poaching, that sounds violent, but they're, they're luring Japanese artists to uh, go to work in China because they're paying more money and they know that these um, young Japanese artists are very skilled and they have a tradition, the tr traditions we've been talking about, they have those traditions behind them and they can uh, come work in Shanghai or Beijing or Guangzhou and make a lot more money. And uh, some young Japanese artists are understandably taking up those offers. And some of course go to work for Pixar or Disney and, and get uh, health insurance <laughs> and uh, they can buy a car and uh, buy a house. So the Japanese industry, uh, it's a, there's more awareness of this problem in the industry than there was 10 years ago, for example. And some people are trying to fix it, particularly the CGI studios. But it is a problem. The one thing I would say is that what I was talking about in my presentation, the style of storytelling, the sensibility that comes from Japanese aesthetics. And I don't want to go, you know, this, I could get attacked for Nihonjin Ron stuff here, you know, in a second. And I don't want to go, I'm not saying that. But there is an incredible inventory, 70 years of manga and anime. You know, a friend of mine in Hollywood have said to me, they have so many stories they can draw from. Uh, Devil Man Crybaby came out on Netflix uh, five years ago or whatever. It was from a, you know, a comic from the 1970, 1972 or 1973. Uh, Nagai Go, you know, a great artist. And they revived it and brought it back. And he couldn't believe it. He was like, oh, I can't believe all these people in Paris and New York want to talk to me. It's incredible. But the fact is the inventory of stories and visuals from decades of manga and anime is incredible in Japan. There's so much richness that I don't believe, Bill, that anybody is going to catch up with Japan in my lifetime. Let's put it that way. I think there's just so much great material. And young Japanese know how to draw. They, they learn how to draw. They're very, very good. Even kids, you know, just coming out of uh, middle school. It's amazing. Um, and I, I don't think you can replicate that overnight in uh, another country. I love your idea, Roland, that stories are almost a natural resource that Japan has, uh, that there might not be a lot of oil in the ground, but wow, Japanese folklore mythology is just rich with so many narratives uh, that creators of pop culture can draw upon today. That's right, and so diverse. And to, going back to what Julia said, um, because of Japan's relatively flexible sense of spirituality, versus institutional religion, which we have in the West in particular, and some countries in the East, obviously. But Japan has, you know, is Buddhism and there's Shinto, and they're pretty flexible in terms of towing the party line. And I think that does make Japanese stories a little more agile in the sense that they're not driving home a Judeo-Christian ethic, uh, even politically, um, despite Japan's relative political sclerosis, it's, it's not a, a country of polemics. You know, there aren't people arguing about gun control or abortion. So the artists can explore these ideas without being, you know, heavy handed all the time. I mean, don't you think, Julia, that, that I mean, I think that's what you were saying, right? It's partly. Yes, yes. So some things, you know, we got to be careful, with, especially with the um, working, bringing Japanese content to here right now. I got to make sure that to tell the Japanese team, oh, that, that's a cool idea, but it will not be accepted in the United States. So you, we have to modify that. Um, and also to convince the Japanese team what the American team wants to make. They're like, oh, you can't put drugs and stuff in there. But that's what people are used to here seeing. Um, they they want to see more violence, more um, grandiose stuff happening in the story. So there's there's a balance, a difficult balance to it. And going back to what you were saying um, about the abundance of stories, I think that could be part of the reason why um, Japanese artists or creators are not appreciated as much because people are just used to seeing it 
for free. That's a good point. It's just, That's a good point. It's just everywhere. So yeah. um, they're like, why pay for it? Yeah. And that's kind of leading to people, with the, these creators um, working for Chinese or Korean companies um, because they, they're better at creating a better platform for overseas, um, like Webtoons and stuff. Um, now, if you put your story on Webtoon, more people see it than publish it in the with the publisher. So I think that that's, that's a good thing, but at the same time, it, it is a bad thing. That's an excellent point. I also would add that, um, and this is something I've been writing about recently, Japan has this great monozukuri tradition of making physical things really well, whether it's a Sony Walkman or a Nintendo Switch or lacquerware or ceramics, I mean, you, you name it. Um, even uh, Konmari is, is physically involved, right? She cleans up your house. <laughs> And I do sometimes think in Japan, there is um, a tendency not to take serious abstract ideas like software or entertainment or pitches. You know, you pitch a story to a Japanese film uh, producer and they're, they're, they're not going to put any money behind it. They just don't take. But it's interesting. I, I never thought of it the way you just said it, Julia, that maybe there, there's so many stories in Japan. It's a story making machine. That if you come along with more stories, it's kind of like, well, what's, that's like all of us. What, what's the big deal? We're not going to pay you for that. <laughs> a story, another story, full of stories, right? Every street corner in Osaka has a story. Uh, that's a really good point. We are getting some wonderful questions from our YouTube audience, so I want to go straight to those. Uh, obviously, we could talk about this topic on our own without many prompts, uh, but I do want to address all the folks that have uh, tuned in. So here's one. Has the growth of foreign markets for anime and manga opened up opportunities for foreign artists to work in that industry? That seems like something you can really talk to directly, Julia. Definitely, yes. Um, like, for example, the manga I made with an American publisher, the artist is from China. So, and I, I didn't know who the artist was until she started working with us. Um, so yeah, it definitely opened up uh, opportunities. And even with Mixie, um, some of the artists we have are not from Japan. And it's, I think with the internet, you don't have to be physically on site to work together now. So that has definitely made um, made it very easy for diverse group of people to work together. Roland, do you have a thought on that? Yeah, I mean, uh, that to me is one of the most exciting uh, more recent developments in manga and anime in Japan. Um, you have, uh, I mean, I, I, I can mention that several, several artists, but, uh, a good friend of mine, uh, Marjorie Liu, who's Chinese American, Taiwanese American. She's done a, a comic series called Monstrous, which is illustrated by a Japanese artist, Sana Takeda. And they work together on its incredible series. It's great, great, um, you know, sort of, sort of feminist monster series. It's awesome. And you have um, now, and I, something I've written about uh, recently, uh, a Black uh, American artist working with Japanese uh, manga and anime producers, incredible. Sean Thomas comes to mind immediately. He did uh, uh, Yasuke, the recent story, uh, anime story about uh, uh, the first black, or maybe the only black samurai uh, in Japanese history. Uh, Darj Stagio, you know, uh, which is an incredible, uh, incredible studio, which is founded by a, a black American a friend of mine uh, and working in Tokyo now. Um, so there is that excitement. I will say, not to be a, put a damper on it, but um, the market for foreign made or non-Japanese made comics and uh, inside Japan is pretty weak. Mm -hmm. uh, the Japanese audience is not very recep receptive to manga or comics made outside of Japan. And Julia, maybe I'd, I'd be curious to see what what you think about that. I mean, when you're trained, in other words, if you're not in the manga industry and you're not 100% Japanese, it's kind of hard, you know, I've, I've talked to people about this um, 
non-Japanese artists who live in Japan who are cartoon, you know, uh, comics artists. And it's very hard for them to get into the, the market in Japan. Um, what do you think? I agree. And I never thought about it from that perspective, not being um, like a full Japanese person. And now I'm like, maybe that's why none, none of the publisher <laughs> wanted to publish my story. And uh, it was the American publisher who wanted to do it. Um, that's a very interesting perspective. It's definitely different for a gaming industry. Right now, what I do is kind of merge or mesh of um, gaming and manga. So it's an app. So it's, 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 we're in a weird spot right now. Is, is this manga? It's not published from a publisher. It's for coming from a gaming publisher. But to me, more of two worlds are getting more and more merged together. Um, I think we'll start seeing less of that attitude because I, I heard many Japanese publishers are, do, do want to go global. But in order to do that, they have to create an app. So in a way, it's not going to be paper printing or um, online manga. So probably, I'm, I'm just assuming this is going to start to change as the form of manga, the platform of manga start or continue to evolve. I just love where this conversation uh, has gone. Uh, let me uh, take us to another question uh, from the audience. So uh, uh, one of our viewers says, I'm impressed by manga anime featuring transgendered or LGBTQI characters. It seems like manga and anime can influence powerful change. What are your thoughts about that? Oh, well, I, I grew up watching Sailor Moon and I never questioned how this one character is probably what we call non-binary. And then um, they had a girlfriend in a story. Um, and that character always dressed up as a man sometimes and, and, and her fighting costume was a female costume. But as a child, I never questioned because it was just out there. And then there was also like a gay um, couple scene and whatnot, but it just came so naturally. I think in Japan, there's no opposition or pe people's block to LGBTQ. It's not discussed as much as in the US, but, but that's because people are just like, so what? People, that, that's how they are. So I think that's um, why in many anime and manga, you see LGBTQ characters appearing with no like special um, implication. Like, it's like, so what? This, it's just another character. They're just who they are. It's not a big deal in Japanese manga and anime. Yeah, I, uh, first of all, I wanna, I wanna very quickly name check my friend, um, um uh isom uh why am i blanking on his name uh uh the founder of of uh of dark stagio um arthel arthel isom isom i i i wanted to mention his name a minute ago and i just uh blanked while we were talking but uh he's the black founder of the only black founded anime studio in Japan and, and he's brilliant. He's a great artist and a great boss. He runs a great studio and it's it, really a huge achievement that, that, you know, black American guy from New Jersey made this pilgrimage all the way to Japan and runs his own studio and they produce great art and he's devoted to the art of anime. I mean, he's, he's into the whole Japanese tradition. So I just want to name check Arthel, but, uh, yeah, I mean, it, it's interesting what you were saying, Julie, because I, you know, we both know that <laughs> in some respects, in terms of like, you know, the statistics on, on women managers in Japan are just atrocious. Women just do not go above a certain ceiling. We know that. Um, most women are working part-time and making part-time wages in Japan. Uh, we know that there's sexism, there's racism, there's chauvinism. Um, Japan is hardly Shangri-La. Um, and when it, ter when it comes to LGBTQI, I mean, I think it's what you said that, that people in a sense will look the other way to a degree that storytelling is storytelling. It's whether you're writing about the ghost of a Kabuki actor looking in on his, his, his ex-wife, his wife and her lover, because they tossed him in a swamp. You can go anywhere in a way 
and there's no Judeo-Christian restrictions. There's no um, um, moralism that dictates what you can say as a story. And to some extent, your behavior in Shinjuku Nichome is up to you because that's context. That's your context. It's not our context. It's whatever you want to do. And so there is that fluidity and that tolerance. At the same time, as you know, we all know, yeah, Japan can be pretty backwards when it comes to civil rights for people who are different from the 98% of the population that defines itself as Japanese, right? I mean, there is also a level of intolerance. And I think it's important to, you know, manga and anime, just like American Hollywood, just like American television, just like American fiction to some extent, it is a fantasy. It's a projection by artists who are skilled or gifted storytellers who have a vision that incorporates their culture. But it is a fantasy on some level. And as much as I agree with you, Julia, like it, it, you know, in storytelling and like Sailor Moon, I mean, some ways it's like groundbreaking. But in other ways, it's like, that's not exactly what your life would be like if you were a young lesbian in a Japanese high school, especially outside of Tokyo, right? So it's important, I think, to have that balance that, you know, I try to tell young Americans who talk to me and yes, you should go to Japan, but please know it's not an anime. It's a place where people work really hard and some people are quite poor and it can be difficult uh, and you're not going to be embraced uh, just because you're special that that, you know, don't expect it to be um, a cakewalk, I guess, which is which is obvious, of course. But you know what I mean? Some people see manga and anime and they get so excited and they should get excited. But then they think, oh, Japan's going to be my savior. And that's not fair to Japan actually. Um, maybe for going back to the question for powerful change, um, maybe the, the Japanese content, it might not work that way in Japan, but could inspire like kids in America or some other countries to feel like, oh, so you can be LGBTQ and then still be a hero in a story like, a, like Sailor Moon. They're strong heroes. So I guess the, the, the storytelling could inspire people in other countries that, um, I don't know, maybe, maybe they, they, they can relate to the character and feel like, oh, I could, I could be, I could have courage to be part of the change. I don't know. It's, it's oh, a difficult I, topic. <laughs> I agree completely with that, Julia. I think there's a way in which uh, looking at controversial or difficult issues through the lens of another culture can actually be empowering because it's not so close to home. Uh, and I think of the ways in which uh, Squid Game uh, encouraged discussions about inequalities within capitalism that were very specific to Korea, but which people could read back on their experiences in the United States or Western Europe uh, or wherever. Let me ask another question from uh, the audience. Has foreign demand for anime and manga changed the art form? Roland, what do you think? Well, I think there, there are two, I, I've talked about this before and I've written about this. I think there are two categories that have been sort of evolving over the past maybe, maybe five years uh, since Netflix opened their offices in Tokyo. And one is anime inspired work. And you can call it whatever you like. I mean, that's my phrase of choice, but in other words, there's CGI and digital and 3D work that's being produced now, often joint productions or co-productions between Japanese studios and studios in other countries. And it's inspired by anime. It has a kind of anime look, maybe an anime feel, maybe even anime characters, or maybe it's based on legacy content like Blade Runner anime that's come out, or you have Ultraman, you know, from the great Tokusatsu series, which I grew up with. <laughs> uh, and, and you have this stuff that's coming out that's kind of anime inspired, but it's 3D, it's CGI, maybe it's got a much bigger budget. And it's meant for an international audience. 
and then you still have <laughs> Uh, what I would, I suppose, call traditional or conventional anime that's made in tiny um, studios above ramen shops in, uh, in, in West Tokyo on the Chuosen. And they churn some of it out. Some of it's absolutely atrocious and terrible. And some of it's really great and funny and creative. And that is basically made for the Japanese audience. It doesn't mean that a foreign audience won't love it. And you have these, you know, titles that just take off overseas. I mean, when, when Kimetsu no Yaiba, uh, Demon Slayer was, you know, first out as a manga in Japan and Taisho era stuff, I was like, this is not gonna, this is not gonna work overseas. Boom. Then the movie comes out and it's number one. It just blows everything away. So it, 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 it's actually very hard to predict that stuff now. Because there's stuff that seems to be made for Japanese in Japan that blows open overseas. I mean, this, um, what's this series? Uh, Bungo, Bungo Stray Dogs, hmm. Literary Stray Dogs. I mean, it's crazy. Uh, Osamu, Dazai, Osamu Dazai's 1948 novel, No Longer Human, which is a pretty depressing story about, you know, a miserable guy. It's uh, the number one Japanese literature bestseller on U.S. Amazon because of this anime series that features him as a character. And who'd have thunk Bungo Stray Dogs would take off overseas, outside of Japan, literary stray dogs based on Japanese novelists and writers. Uh, so I, it's very interesting. But I think what the point I want to make is these two categories forming. There's anime-inspired work, which can be really interesting, but very different. And then there's the sort of homegrown stuff, which sometimes takes off overseas in ways you would, I would never expect, to be honest. Um, kind of adding on to that for, I think you talked about outlines of like ukiyo-e and stuff earlier in your presentation. Um, I, I, I did study art in college too. And I noticed the difference between Western art and Japanese art is the Western art traditionally didn't have that strong streak of black outlines. Um, I'm not sure if it, they started that after the ukiyo-e was introduced to the West or not, but in American comics, the outlines are very strong compared to Japanese um, manga or anime. But looking at recent popular anime and stuff, I've noticing the outlines are getting like thicker or stronger, like Kimetsu no Yaiba and other um, new animes that's coming out. So I'm just, I don't know, maybe um, the American comic style is influencing a little bit of the, in the Japanese anime because compared to the anime during the early 2000s, I feel like now they, their out outlines are stronger when it comes to art style. We have a load of questions that I'm afraid we're not going to have time to get to, uh, but I do want to end up by asking you something that I'm expecting is on a lot of our viewers' uh, minds, and that is, what is your manga or anime masterpiece? Uh, what do you consider that special one, uh, and what makes it so great? Uh, and Julia, you cannot say your own, uh, even though I know it qualifies as a masterpiece. Julia, go ahead. <laughs> Since I can't say it's my own. Since you um, can't say be, it's your own. <laughs> it'll be Kaze Hikaru. Um, it's a manga about Shinsengumi, which was like a police force uh -huh. formed um, to protect the shogun um, side of people during right before the Meiji Restoration. The protagonist, she is a girl pretending to be a guy because her parents got killed by, assassinated by the people who wanted to support the other side. Um, Anyways, the reason why I love it is how it ends is, in the end, it's not a happy ending. It, make, it puts you in a deep thought, kind of like after watching um, The Silence, <laughs> the movie by um, Shusaku, so Endo Shusaku. <laughs> so that's my favorite. <laughs> Wonderful. Roland? Well, it, it, Bill, this is a really tricky question to answer. As you know, it's like, you know, somebody asking you your favorite album. It's like crazy. <laughs> so many genres and... If you're as old as I am, you've, you've heard so much music, there's so much you love. So, I mean, I, 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 have, to, I have to cite Hotaru no Haka, Grave of the Fireflies. Um, I've seen that 
film so many times. I've taught it uh, to students around the world. I've written about it. And whenever I see it, it just seems heartbreakingly well paced. Now, I know that sounds, you know, it's, it's obvious to say it's emotionally moving and it's, it's heartbreaking, but, but the pacing is incredible. I don't know. It's very hard to tell a story. <laughs> you know what I mean? To tell a story well. And I, I get paid to do that. And it's very, very difficult. And a lot of it is pacing the narrative, the quiet, the, the moments of the harpsichord, the moments of when you're looking out the window and there's just fire in the sky. And I just think Takahata and his team nailed it from start to end, how to tell this story, which could have been maudlin and boring and obvious and somehow surprises me every time I watch it. I don't know how it does it. It's, it's a masterwork, I think. And um, I also, you know, I mentioned Cowboy Bebop. I love the television series of Watanabe Shinichiro. I just think he's brilliant at doing these series that are mostly about nothing, like Seinfeld, but are so smart and so clever and so funny. And the music is always amazing. So that's anime series, right? Television series. And then uh, in manga, I mean, I, I, there's so much. Obviously, Tezuka's, you know, uh, Phoenix is incredible. It's a masterwork. But I also think Shigeru Mizuki, who's not as well known, uh, who did Gegege no Kitaro, the, the famous uh, anime series in Japan. But his uh, Onwards to Our Noble Deaths, mm -hmm. which uh, the great Zach Davison, uh, wonderful translator, translated into English. That's incredible. I mean, it's, 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 it completely takes him out of his normal style and is more neorealistic and is about the horrors of war and it's manga and it's just brilliant. It reads like a novel, I mean, or better than a novel or, or a different kind of novel. So I'm sorry, that's too much. You asked for one. <laughs> That it's is just wonderful. too much. It, it captures beautifully the richness uh, of this form. Yeah. I can't believe how quickly this hour went uh, <laughs> uh, with you. Thank you so much, Julia Meckler and Roland Keltz, uh, for your insight. Thank you, Bill. Thanks. Thank you, Bill and Julia. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you so much. Thanks again to oh. everyone at Japan Society, especially Sekiya Tomomi, to everyone at the Portland Japan Garden and to the government of Japan for making this event possible. Thank you to all our audience members who are joining us from around the world tonight. If you have a moment, please fill out a short survey about this program. You'll find the link in the YouTube chat and we'd really appreciate your feedback. You can find out more about upcoming Japan Society programs at japansociety.org. Good night. Good morning. Thanks again, everyone.